JB, 36 games, 36 games this week. And uh, as the uh, bottom of the screen says, we have all kinds of games to go over. Comebacks, a four-overtime game, are you kidding me? And some crucial games, one of which I attended for conference purposes. Uh, I know yesterday you were kind of in and out, but uh, you were caught by surprise by one of the scores when I texted you. I think you stopped watching that WPI Merchant Marine game as much as mo many people did and almost fell off your chair when you saw what the final score was. And we'll go over it in a minute, but uh, what were your thoughts on week eight as a preliminary view here? Well, I mean, it's still the regular season and apparently anything is possible. We've got lots of different things going on and, uh, you know, the. We, we think we've got it all figured out, Frank, and then upsets happen <laughs> left and right. And I mean, there are still, you know, certain teams that are you know, in, in control of their destiny, but there was a few curveballs thrown on Saturday for sure. Yeah, curveballs, that, that puts it lightly, that's for sure. Hey, why don't we go over the games? Uh, and then we'll have a lot more to talk about afterward about the standings, where everything is, and some interviews as well. So as always, it is time for crunch time for the games of October 20th, 2018, Week 8. And the handy iPad tells me I'm going to start right now with the CCC in this Crunch Time segment. And uh, what a game between Salve, Regina, and Curry. For Salve to have any chance for a playoff uh, chance here for the CCC, they have to keep one loss in conference. Uh, they already lost West New England. And uh, incredible job by them at the end of this game defensively to scoop up the ball and score a 30 yard fumble return for touchdown. Made it 30 21 in favor of Salve, Regina credit to I believe that was Brandon O'Neill who got credit for that recovery with 17 seconds left uh, Colonels outgained Seahawks in the yardage ironically enough 400 266 but uh, defense wins championships in individual games on occasion as well and that's how <laughs> Salve pulls this out and uh, just to uh, round out the CCC quickly here <laughs> Western New England uh, does something that nobody else has done to the University of New England put up 70 on them 70 to 13 as they outgained uh, basically doubled them, uh, 616 to 312 in yardage. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, Al Coleman scored six touchdowns, four on the ground, for goodness sakes. And then Endicott keeping pace here as well, 4-0 and in the conference. We keep talking about that Week 10 game between them and Western New England. They beat Becker 45-13. They've won five straight by an average of 25 points per game. You feeling like that Week 10 game is still the one to watch? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, these two have separated themselves from the pack. I'll do respect to the Seahawks, and uh, they give, I'll give them credit for the win against Curry. They, their defense you know, pulled it out for them. But, yeah, I think this, uh, this one's coming down to Week 10. Let's go to the ECFC. No video to share with this, but uh, a lot of discussion to come here. And uh, Dean took care of Gallaudet, and that's a very important result here, 53-21. Uh, Bulldogs scored 26 in the second quarter, 623 yards in the game for them. And what that really means here is that Gallaudet is in trouble with the conference race. And Husson has a really good chance here after their 54-14 win over Anna Maria to take this conference maybe even before Week 10, although it's not for sure. That game with Gallaudet may still be a de facto championship game for us and we'll see what happens talk more about that later in this on facebook and uh, suny maritime keeping pace to a certain degree 68 41 over castleton 16 touchdowns between the two teams 980 total yards of offense privateers rush for 376 in the game <laughs> but, but jb i mean when you look at this uh, situation in this conference right now it's really uh, gallaudet's almost uh you know got to win out here they had they do have to win out and they have to be yeah, both Hudson and SUNY Maritime yeah and I think I think honestly that where we're seeing this thing ahead is that you know we're seeing programs like Dean and and others sort of start to turn the corner to be more winning programs tougher season maybe for the Bison but I think you know Hudson is just cruising to to the title here and it's it's not official yet but you might as well pencil them in for one of the 32 teams in the tournament see what happens here and let's go to the empire uh, check that let's go to the mascac next excuse me and uh staying in new england oh, yeah. it is a big game here this was uh really unexpected uh four overtime affair 
Uh, Western Connecticut yeah. had to come back. They were down, what, 28-14, to 14, I think it was, at one 28 point? 28-14 to 14 to start the fourth quarter, yeah. I watched this game on uh, Saturday night, and it was outstanding. Uh, I mean, the Colonials just kept fighting back, and, you know, the, the, the overtimes just kept happening. Like, they would score, or there would be a missed extra point, or something got blocked. It was, it was a crazy game. 50-48 to 48 for the final. Uh, Kyle McKinnon, I think, was the really sort of the star of the day. Four uh, rushing touchdowns to sort of help, and including the game winner. And so, yeah, the Colonials are now seven to zero, thanks to a just a gutty performance for them. Framingham State keeping pace though, twenty seven to two over Westfield State. Interesting score there. Uh, they all scored uh, first on a safety, and then FSU the rest of the way by twenty seven points. And so we have Framingham State at four and one. Western Connecticut at 4 and 0 in the conference or 5 and 0 check that in the conference and that means that basically they're in a showdown mode for week 10 on the evening of that by the way it won't be part of our blitzer show it stays at that time but that's looking like the de facto league championship game of sorts uh, if it's Framingham State that wins obviously they would have to uh, win the next week as well we'll detail that more in a little bit Plymouth State 17 Mass Maritime 14 after upsetting Framingham State Plymouth State almost gets upset themselves uh, the next week, but they get either two late defensive stands to hang on in that game. And UMass Dartmouth 41, Worcester State 27, as UMass Dartmouth only uh, with two league losses right now at three and two, but very little chance to have any much, anything much to say in this conference setup right now. Let's go to the new Mac and the the game that we were talking about earlier. Just a shocker of shockers. It was twenty four to nothing at halftime. WPI led this game. Guess what? Merchant Marine wins at twenty five twenty four. Christian Abbott with thirty eight seconds left scores a game winning touchdown. Abbott gives it up. Touchdown! Touchdown, Merchant Marine! If you never did believe in miracles, I have a feeling it's time to try. Held the engineers to 46 rush yards, uh, did Merchant Marine Academy. This is their best start, Merchant Marine Academy, in 15 years. 2003 uh, was the last time they started 6-1. Yeah. They still have a say in this conference race. They've lost MIT, they but they are beating the other teams along the way here, namely in Springfield and WPI. This is yeah. getting really interesting because MIT has to play the meat of their schedule still. And they won against Coast Guard, but not a very impressive uh, number put up there. 13-0 to zero by them. Yep. Yeah. What Close are you thinking call. here with the new Mac before we go to the rest? You know, I think I think the Coast Guard is is a much improved team from last year. So even though they weren't able to put up any points uh, in their game against MIT, they're they're going to be a tough out for everybody, including the Mariners, who may need to beat them in Week 11 for the Secretary's Cup on ESPN to have a shot at either a share or some kind of uh, playoff berth or something. But you know, you had to give Coach George and 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 the Bears credit there in New London. Uh, they're they're having a great season. Certainly a disappointment to lose to, to Coach Bubna, and I think we'll we may even have some clips, um, you know, from that game. Some comments from uh, from uh, Ugam Goyal, the the, uh, the quarterback of MIT, and, and their head coach Brian Bubna, we had early on in the program. But uh, you know, MIT keeps going, and they're they're in the pole position there for that Pool B bid if they can win out. Norwich 15, May Maritime 7, and that's kind of a strange score when you think that the Cadets outgained the Mariners by 274 yards in the game. Uh, they only beat them by 8 points in the scoreboard. And Springfield 23, Catholic 11, Hunter Belzo 185 total yards, 2 touchdowns. Uh, still no sign of Chad Shade back for Springfield, and that still bodes poorly for them ultimately. Let's finish out the NESCAC while we're uh, in there, finish out the uh, New England uh, conferences with the NESCAC. Let's try that. We'll finish yeah, out the NESCAC by doing it. Uh, it's Tufts 28, Williams 21. Williams on a two-game losing streak. This is not the time to be streaking in this direction in the season. The Jumbos tied the game just before halftime and only one touchdown scored subsequent to that. Ryan McDonald 17 for 28, 187 yards and two touchdowns. So they Tufts uh, moves a 5-1. and one. Trinity 48 to 6 over Bowden. Bantams outgained the Polar Bears 505 to 161. And Amherst 33, Wesleyan 3, excuse me, and Amherst at 6 0. Amherst's next two opponents, Tufts and Trinity. 
So they have a very tough schedule to come. And then obviously Williams. So Amherst has not played the meat of their schedule by any stretch of the imagination here. You said it last week. We'll see where it goes. Middlebury beats Bates 35-34. The Panthers led by 15 at the half, but had to hold on. And Colby, 23, Hamilton, 21, and a uh, meeting of not basement dwellers per se, but they're pretty near the bottom of that pack, and Colby gets their first win of the season. Next up, Empire 8, and we're going to go to the Utica Pioneers. The Pios just can't decide which team they are this season, I think is what it's come down to. They lose to Morrisville really? State a week earlier, and then they figure out a way to beat Alfred. Pioneers had to come back twice to beat the Saxons, and Logan Wilcox went uh, 50% passing, but 236 in yardage, two touchdowns, two interceptions, running back Nacer Smith with 25 rushes and 87 yards. But Utica, just a gritty, gritty team when they have to be. It's one of those teams that plays to the level of their competition, it seems like, and can win or lose based on it any given week. Yeah, and, and, and Naz Smith is actually the running back for Alfred, and he's typically been averaging over 100 yards every game this season so the fact that the the pioneers are able to shut him down to only 87 yards says a lot about how their defense improved and yeah like it's a little bit of a jekyll and hyde thing going on with the pioneers um alfred we thought might have been a little more competitive maybe it's you know after the beating they took last week from from brockport who had another big win which i think he'll tell us about in a second 65 to 7 in fact uh the eagles led 30 to nothing at halftime and it was just yeah. incredible. Minus 48 rushing yards for Buffalo State in that game. Minus 48. It is not the record. Minus 112 is the record in golden olden days. But minus 48 rushing yards. Better than their average. I guess uh, Coach Angoni took our interview to heart when I asked him, was he concerned about his defense giving up 12 <laughs> rushing yards to Alfred the previous week in that 52 to nothing win. SUNY Morrisville, 35, oh St. John goodness. Fisher, 7. Morrisville is above 500 right now at 4-3. and three. They outgained the Cardinals 444-160 to 160 in the game. Nick Edmond with two touchdowns. And Fisher was held to 35 rushing yards, so Morrisville doing their best Brockport impression there uh, in terms of rush defense. Yeah. Cortland, 56. Hartwick, 3. Cortland keeping pace. The Week 10 game is going to be Brockport-Cortland. And if Cortland were to win it, they could very well win the Empire 8. A lot to talk about still in the Empire 8 because of that. Let's go to the Liberty League. RPI holds on against Hobart, 31-24. The Statesman had a rally late down 24-3 to at one point. They outgained RPI 449-410, but a lot of that in what you would call, quote, garbage time, I guess, or comeback time, well, whatever you want to call actually, it. Actually, it's, I'll give you the weirdest stat of the weekend, Frank, and, I, and this ahead. is something we got from Ed Baker from WEOS, who's been a contributor to our program over the years. For the first 21 and a half minutes, Hobart had 10 total yards of offense. And the final rest of the game, you know, do the math. It's like 430 something. 439, I think that would be uh, otherwise yeah. unreal. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But Such RPI's defense, um, James, 15 interceptions on the season for RPI's defense, two yes. in that game. So incredible uh, stat that we're overlooking throughout the uh, season here. And George Marinopoulos with two touchdowns passing in that game. Union 29, St. Lawrence 7. St. Lawrence with one loss uh, in the Liberty League. Still has some level of say here in this conference, but they're going to have to play better than this as the Dutchman led 22 to nothing at halftime. Ike Erebor at 33 rushes, 118 yards, and Will Bellamy with a good bounce back game. 20 for 32, 165, and two touchdowns. Ithaca 28, University of Rochester 3. Game was stopped midway through the second quarter for a weather delay, which I, I'm not sure what weather was going through in that area. But uh, nonetheless, it didn't uh, become a hurricane for Wahid Nabi, who had three touchdowns on the game, 234 yards passing. Rochester was held to 28 rushing yards to the MAC, where I was. Uh, or not where I was. That would be the NJAC. In the MAC, uh, where I was watching a game in utter amazement, I should say, is Misericordia 37 FDU Florham 33. We got a lot of clips here to play, so I'm going to explain to you what you're going to be seeing here. Misericordia had to score a touchdown just to pull within one possession. As you can see, the score on the bottom, bottom of the screen. They score that touchdown, they go for the onside kick. They recover the onside kick near midfield. Then they still had to score again, folks. And whoa, what happens? Look at this touchdown now. Because of this herky-jerky video, it's tough to tell the foot came in and bounds, but it's pretty clear to me that it did uh, before the stutter in the video. And so 
The game-winning touchdown pass was to Sam Gillison with 33 seconds left from Brady Williams for a 37-33 unbelievable comeback win to keep Misericordia at 5-0 in the conference. Del Val, number 21 Please. in the nation, also at 5-0 in the conference after their win 52-7 over Lebanon Valley, where the Aggies outrushed the Dutchman 304-59. James, it looked like we were going to lose that, uh, let's say, potential tiebreaker scenario. We'll talk more about later, ultimately, but it's still intact here as Misericordia pulls another one out. Uh, it, it's amazing because, and this is this isn't the first time that they've done this this season. They, they they're sort of the like cardiac cougars. I mean, they they find ways to win games late. And uh, Brady Williams, man, like he is really having a heck of a season. Kings beats Albright 37-26. Uh, time o'clock, 393 yards of total offense, three touchdowns for Kings. Uh, Stevenson uh, with a nice uh, win, 33-21, trying to keep pace still despite that loss to Del Val earlier in the season where they let one get away. They're 5-1 and one in the conference now. They uh, pulled away on a 20-point run in the mid uh, second quarter uh, region of the game. Ty Crabb with 21 for 26, 229, two touchdowns, and two INTs for the defense of Stevenson. Lycoming, 52. Alvernia, zero. Uh, it, look, Warriors led 31 to nothing at halftime. It didn't get any better for Alvernia in that game. Let's end with the end jack. And we got two games to focus on here. First, this was the game I was at. Frostburg State, 24. Montclair State, 17. Well, look. It was a uh, ending of trading of touchdowns in the fourth quarter. You're going to see first the Montclair State touchdown. It was right in the end zone area for it and shot this video of it. And it coming right at you, basically. A touchdown put them uh, at a 17-17 tie. But just a couple plays later, Connor Cox throws deep downfield and connects for the winning touchdown, 24-17. to The final score, 71-yard touchdown pass there. And... Congratulations, Frostburg State, but they did lose a little love in the top 25 poll uh, this week because of this close game. And I actually swapped them with Brockport State on my ballot because I had Brockport State below them until this week. Now, yeah, yeah, big win, and they control their own destiny. They, the heck of the polls at the end of the day, but they got to play better. We'll talk more about this in a little bit, obviously. I also want to, though, bring up a big upset. Rowan, 28. Wesley, 27. Number eight team of the nation falls in this game, and Rowan has to hold on repeatedly in that fourth quarter to win it. it what's somewhat amazing here is we've lost uh, sight of where Rowan is. They're four and two in the conference, but five and two overall. They're really having a better season than you would think because we don't talk about them that much since that Widener win, where Widener kind of fell apart since that point. But Rowan. Uh, with 449 yards of total offense, not usually their specialty. Their defense really won this game, though, in, in my mind, because of what they had to do in the fourth quarter to hold on in the game. So uh, congratulations, Rowan. And they still have some games coming up here we'll talk more about in a little bit that could weigh the balance or uh, you know strike the balance of the uh, NJAC. Uh, TCNJ 13, Kane 8, teams combined for 10 rushing yards. So <laughs> go, go figure that game. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sometimes i got to read what is written in front of me before I actually read it out loud because I didn't see that one coming. Uh, Pangborn yeah. with 20 uh, for 32, 208, and uh, one touchdown for Kane, but three interceptions. So this was just kind of a defensive struggle in this game for quite a while. We'll put it nicely. Uh, Christopher yeah. Newport, 39, William Patterson, 10. Uh, that's Brock Carnes with uh, two rushing touchdowns as quarterback for CNU and their defense with four interceptions. And Salisbury, 33, Southern Virginia, zero. That's the next opponent for Frostburg State, by the way, is Southern Virginia. Seagulls with 384 rushing guards, just one pass attempt. Are we surprised by that? No, we're not, because we always talk about it on Crunch Time. And that was Crunch Time for the games of October 20th. Where to begin here? My goodness, James. Um, I, I think the NJAC mess right now is a good place to start uh, in some ways. Yep. Um, it got a little colder here. Before we go anywhere, it, it got a, lot, a little colder here, and you've got a hoodie on, and you're living in Florida. So what the heck's going on here uh, before we do this? Oh, uh, my my home, my old hometown Red Sox are going back to the World Series. You can see I got to some old helmets back there, including a Dodgers one, which is interesting because – I spent 13 years in Los Angeles, and now here we have the Red Sox and Dodgers playing in the World Series, I think, for the first time ever, which is 
pretty amazing given the, the histories of these franchises. I actually bought this sweatshirt uh, in 2007 World Series in Denver, Colorado, uh, because it dropped below 40 degrees there, uh, I think in game three. I went to game three and game four. Yep, you got the, the little, you know, a little local New England flavor. And so, you know, I'm feeling a little, doing a little Belichick y type thing right now, although. I also want to give a shout out to uh, a former guest of the show and a friend, uh, Ali Marpet, who just signed a big extension with the Buccaneers. Um, things are going great for him. He just also got named captain, and even though it was a pretty ugly win, the Buccaneers still pulled off a 26 to 23 victory today in, in Ali's first sort of official game as a captain for the Bucks. So they're three and three on the season. They're still in the hunt, and so it, it was Sunday here, uh, or good anyway for. Us uh, Forlanders now in Florida who happen to know people on the Buccaneers or something. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So uh, where were we? We were talking about football at some point here. Uh, Division three stuff. Jack. Let's go. Let's go up to Joy Z. Yeah. yeah, we got to talk about Joy Z. We'll talk about Jersey. Uh, Joy Z, as you said, and I was at Montclair State for uh, the big game. Uh, I would introduce all the players myself that I interviewed, but it's much easier just have them interview or introduce themselves uh, in true Delane Fitzgerald style. He got his four players, and I said, you know what, we're, we're going to try something new here. We're going to do them all at once, and uh, it actually worked out very well, yeah. as you're about to see. Uh, Connor Cox, two receivers, and a uh, defensive player. <laughs> I'm trying to remember back to what we, uh, what we had. Excuse me, not two receivers. Uh, one running back. Uh, Jamal Morant will uh, object if I Jamal, don't uh, get that yeah. correct. He Excuse me. Player, yeah. So uh, you're about to see uh, that interview right now. Okay, after a big win here, 24 to 17 by Frostburg, we have a whole cavalry of uh, Frostburg State players. Identify yourselves, guys. Connor Cox, quarterback. Malik Morris, receiver. Jerquan Reed, middle linebacker. Jamal Morant, running back. Now. Three offense, one defense. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, Connor, first off, uh, slow start for your offense, uh, but things uh, turn around in the second half. What inspired you guys uh, to kind of turn this around? Was it that Montclair touchdown before halftime? What happened? Very slow start. Um, we were uh, very disappointed in the first half because uh, we're a much better team than we came out and showed. Uh, our motivation, I mean, we just knew we were the better team, and there's a, there's a lot to play for right now. They're 4-1. and one. We couldn't afford to drop one and have a tie at the end. I mean, it was a big game. We had to win. Uh, we got hyped up in the locker room. We didn't hang our heads. We knew seven-point game. We knew we'd be able to come out and put up points. Now, uh, your old line has asked me to ask you, uh, since we've uh, become close with them over time now, uh, do you owe them anything in this game? Of course I do. I owe everything to my old line. There you go, folks. Uh, and uh, Malik, uh, you had some uh, great catches uh, down the stretch here. Uh, you know this team uh, coming in was going to be a good defensive team. Did you struggle to get your footing in this game because of their defense? Take me through your game a little bit. Uh, the game started off um, pretty much how we expected it. But throughout the game, we noticed a couple different looks, and I like the way our coaching staff attacked where their weak spots were. What do you think about Connor's uh, arm? Uh, is he uh, all that and uh, then some? Um, Connor is all that and some. Uh, it's just Connor football. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we live by, Connor football. Just let Connor make the plays and we make plays too. <laughs> Man, an incredible one uh, we have up on Twitter uh, in that second half. Uh, a lot of time that his offensive line bought him. But uh, let's come over here. I'm going to stay on offense for one second. And Jamal. Two touchdowns. Uh, your legs kind of opened up the game, though, for the passing game. Is that kind of what you saw your role as being in this game? Yeah, uh, they, they came in with the number one ranked defense in the end, Jack. Uh, we knew that it was going to be tough running the ball, but uh, if we were able to get a couple good runs, it'll open up for the pass game. So I knew that if we got a couple first downs running the ball, that we can uh, pass the ball effectively. And uh, defensively, you're going to represent here uh, entirely. Mr. Reed, 13 tackles led the, the uh, chart for your team today. Uh, you guys uh, really needed that defense as uh, Montclair, special teams-wise and defensively, especially in the first half, were kind of clamping down. Uh, what do you see as the defense's role this season uh, with the good offense, obviously, but, you know, you guys have been kind of lights out. You were averaging 11 points per game before this game. Uh, now you gave up 17 here. What's the defense's role here as far as you can tell us? Uh, our role is just to go out there every day, play as hard as we can, get the ball back to the offense as fast as we can, and tackle. Did you uh, kind of feel uh, like the defense was stepping it up in the first half as things were not going quite the way the offense wanted? Yeah, I felt like the defense kept our game plan, kept doing what we had to do. 
and we got the ball back to the offense, and they did work. So, guys, uh, the tradition here on In the Huddle, as you know, is shout-outs. You've done this before our last season, so show them how it's done, Connor. But shout-outs to any family, friends, teammates, et cetera, that might be watching or to Coach Fitzgerald, who's kind of watching us over there. I'll give a shout-out to Coach Fitz because he's standing right there. And uh, then I'll give Smart a shout-out to my parents and family. My parents come to every game, and they're here just like they always are. It's nice to have that support. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Coach Fitz for, <laughs> for allowing me to come to uh, Frostburg State. Uh, shout out to all my teammates for fighting hard through the victory and my coaches and my family. I'll give a shout out to Coach Fitz. Shout out to my family, my, my teammates, coaches. And I'm a shout out Coach Fitz as well. And I want to get a special shout out to my old line. They kept working hard and uh, a shout out to my family for watching. Connor, that's how you give a shout out to the old line, by the way. Yeah, I'm shout out my, I shout out all my teammates too, because yeah, I saw that interview. I don't want to, I don't want to shout out myself. OLP, OLP. 24-17 victory here at Montclair State, guys. Uh, continue to winning ways, six and zero at this point, and uh, three to go uh, this yes, season. Sir. So let's see what happens here in a very tough end, Jack. Thank you. Thanks to those guys. I'm so glad that Jamal helped show Connor how to properly thank his offensive line at the end of that interview. Uh, it's It took a I little time, the shout outs. Right yep. yeah, well, Connor forgot to do it. And there was a clip, uh, as uh, we're seeing right here, of the play where I think he really had to thank his offensive line for buying him about 13 minutes to throw the ball uh, and uh, successfully no doing so. Uh, you know, C Connor had some magical moments himself, uh, flipped the ball uh, as well. Here, we'll show you that clip as well, why not? We're full of Connor Cox clips here, courtesy of his offensive line, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah. you know, it, we, we, oh. we finally got him to understand how you thank them appropriately. Was, well, actually, the right way to do it is how Wahid, Wah, yeah, Wahid Nabi, let's try that, Frank, said last week, which is uh, taking them a fat jacks, I think it was. Taking them to lunch, yeah, exactly, yep. dinner, whatever. But, uh, you know, Frank, I have a feeling that not everybody on the Bobcats was really thrilled with the win this weekend. I, I think uh, – a certain head coach was, you know, felt happy to get the win, but was a little less than impressed with his team's performance. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes these, you know, number four rankings. Although I guess, you know, Frostburg has now dropped down to number six uh, a little bit after after this weekend. There's been some other teams that have jumped them, uh, but maybe that's maybe this is a bit of a wake up call. It was a wake up call for Wesley last year when they played Montclair. Sounds like it's been a wake up call for the Bobcats too. I agree with you. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, my experience with uh, Delaney Fitzgerald on the sideline and after the game once we roll this clip. Frank Rossi with head coach of Frostburg. That is Delaney Fitzgerald. I think everybody knows that. And uh, coach, first half, obviously in this 24-17 victory for your team, was not the way you wanted to see it go. Uh, you commented to me uh, after this game that this was kind of one of your worst uh, performances you felt in uh, quite some time, but your team put it to, back together in the second half. Take me through the first half first and then uh, what you said to the team at halftime. We, we have been chronically slow starting football games, especially in the first half, Frank. We, we, uh, we've we now scored one touchdown the last three first quarters, and we've got to get that fixed. Our offense started a little faster today. Excuse me, our defense started a little faster today than they've started in the past. But we've got to get something that lights a fire under our young men. We returned eight starters on an offense from last year that averaged 38 points a game, and they just don't seem to want to get it going coming out of the locker room. We've got to get that fixed on the first half today. Let, let's take our hats off off to Rick G. and Cola and the job that he's done and the job that the Montclair State coaching staff did. The young men from Montclair State played really, really hard the entire first half, and frankly, they just outplayed us. Yeah, it, it seemed like defensively and special teams especially, but then that touchdown gets scored right before uh, they go into the locker room, and you do too. Uh, so what did you tell the team? We went into halftime, had a little bit of an attitude check, um, a complacency check, and just changed the attitude with which we were going to play the last 30 minutes. But the question was, is, men, how, how, how bad do you want to be good? How, how much do you want to win a conference title? And everybody nodded their heads because it's not a big rah-rah bunch that we have in our locker room. But they nodded our head, and I said, well, now we have 30 minutes. We have 30 minutes to show Montclair State and the entire country that we would like to be conference champions and finish this thing. 
You have a team uh, on your schedule still that uh, obviously has had a good season, that, but also struggled with this Montclair team, Salisbury. If you played this type of game against Salisbury, do you think you'd have, stand a chance against the Seagulls? If we continue to play this way, we're going to lose before we get to Salisbury. I need not to, and our players need not to look three three weeks in advance. We've got a good Southern Virginia team. There, there's two teams in this conference that are marketably better this fall than they were last fall, and the first one's Montclair State and the job that their coaching staff's done, and then the second one's Southern Virginia University, and we've got them for homecoming this week, and we need to take them seriously, and we need to play well, and then we go to Keene, and any time you come to Upstate Jersey, it's going to be a challenge, and, and we'll get a fight out of the Keene football team too, and then let, let's worry about Salisbury when we get to Salisbury three weeks from now. But to answer your question, a man to a man, no, Salisbury beat us. We play the way we played today. So how do you go back to the drawing board eh, in a situation like this? Obviously, you did in the second half, but now how do you get them to play consistent four quarters? We're, we're, the, the head coach has to do a better job coaching this football team. We're going to crank things up in practice this week and over the next three weeks. We're going to have a lot more spirited practices than we've had lately, and we're going to get their minds right and get things turned around. The, our players have to start listening to the coaching staff and stop reading the newspaper clippings. They have to stop reading that we're number four in the country and, and start understanding that self-improvement and team improvement trump everything else in this game. Coach, uh, kind of off script a little bit here, but uh, about a year ago to the day, I was seeing in this very position with Coach Mike Drass uh, after his team came back to win against the same Montclair team. Uh, how much is he missed in the end, Jack, and in college football generally? I'll tell you how much he's missed um, by me, and I, I'll send you all a picture when we get home. I have a picture of Mike uh, up above my desk, so every time I look at my computer screen out of the left-hand corner of my eye it, it is Mike there. And, and all Mike and I ever were for the last 15 years were competitors, and, and we competed on recruits, which I lost a whole bunch, and we competed on the field, which I lost all four times against him. Um, but he, here's it. Uh, Mike won, and I'm going to get this wrong, but Mike won 219, 226 games in his 25 years as head coach. But but my, the impact that, that I give you, I have a quick story, quick Mike Drass story, and, and it, yeah, you make me real emotional that he's not here now and that he wasn't here a couple weeks ago when we played, and Coach Knapp and I sit and talk, but I wanted to tell this. I, I went to Mike's memorial service, which was held at Drass Field in Endover, Delaware, um, a couple days, three, four days after Mike passed, and, and I sit there, and there's about 750 people showed up for that torrential downpour, which the torrential downpour, let, let, Mike was letting everybody know that he was there. <laughs> but here is the thing that really, really stood out to me, okay? Out of the 750 people, there were 500 current and former Wesley players there. Those players sit in that rainstorm. Frank, when I say three hours, it was three hours. They had 16 or 17 speakers that all spoke on Mike. It was a long time. They sit there in the rain, most of them without umbrellas, and just got drenched, and it was cold, and it was rainy. And those young men, I wish we had a chair. I'd show you exactly how they sit. But they sit for three straight hours, and they listened, and they were soaked, and they were cold, and they never moved moved and they never thought about moving and, and I was sitting there with Paul Hoffman who's the former head coach at, at Newport News Apprentice School great man but Paul and I because the players didn't get up and leave we refused to get up and leave but I thought that one of the biggest tributes to him was those young men just sitting through that and paying their respects to Mike Mike won 219 games but the effect that Mike had on a thousand young men that he coached over the 25 years is much more substantial than any football game he ever won well said. Uh, why don't we leave it on that note then? But I do want to congratulate you still on a big win today. Ultimately, you know, it's never easy beating beat an undefeated team or one loss team this late in the season. Here's a one loss team that could have just as easily been undefeated after last week, and uh, they uh, took it to you. But you uh, fought back for the 24 to 17 victory. All my life, when I did something well, my grandfather would look at me and say, "Son, it's better to be lucky than good." <laughs> we were lucky today. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Thank you for having me. That was my interview with the head coach of Frostburg State, the Bobcats. That's Delane Fitzgerald. Uh, first off, uh, that story about uh, you know, the Mike Drass uh, funeral and memorial service uh, that was at Wesley uh, is incredible and uh, appreciated him sharing that. We, I didn't uh, ask him about that beforehand. As I said, we kind of went off script there. And I, he always has a good story to tell, and that was one that I didn't see coming. And I, I'm thankful that he shared that with us. Um, you know, they were competitors, no doubt. And, you know, when he was at Southern Virginia, when he was at uh, Frostburg State, uh, you know, Mike Drass was always kind of present on his schedule for a number of years. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's the respect that you form when you play against such a competitor like Drass was, uh, you can see it right there. That was complete earnestness from him. 
uh, in that discussion. Now, let me yep. tell you some one thing. First time I've ever attended a game uh, with uh, Delaney Fitzgerald present. Uh, you know, the first time I actually met him in person, uh, technically. He didn't yeah, uh, yeah. say hi to us at the Stag Bowl like he told us about. I, <laughs> it is amazing being on his sideline. And I was on his sideline in that game because on the Montclair State sideline, it was full of cheerleaders on both sides and family members and stuff like that. So I, was, I would be more in the way of trying to shoot video and everything like that. So I decided we're out the bat. I'm going to be on the Frostburg State sideline. It was a lot emptier. So I'm there. He comes over to me in uh, Mike Toop style, uh, shakes my hand while he's coaching, and then goes back to what he was doing. And then uh, just the interaction with the referees, uh, some of the things I can't repeat uh, for good reason. <laughs> I can um, only imagine. <laughs> but when you, when you mix in his drawl, uh, you know, his Virginia drawl that you can always hear, it's omnipresent, oh, you yeah. know that. And the conversations he has with the refs on the field. At one point, he said something to the effect of, "If we did that when we played football, they would have had, they would have beaten us up for it." And <laughs> to the referee, he said yeah. this out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, he's saying uh, that they've gotten soft in their old ages or something. And he had the people on the sideline rolling uh, the um, you know chain gang uh, who is more of a uh, home-based uh, crew there and whatnot. Sure. So he is, he's not a showman per se, but he is a social, uh, let's say, exemplar. But he will absolutely let the people know what his feelings are at all times. And I did share a photo, share it here. One of the reasons people feel he is a player's coach as much as they do is he is hands-on in every step of the way. And when his trainer is trying to carry off this uh, lineman here, uh, He's out there helping carry the player off. Was trying to uh, say some words of encouragement as he approached him. I couldn't ex hear exactly what it was, but something to the effect of, "I know it hurts right now. I know it hurts, buddy." But and just tries to you know make them feel like you know the million dollars that they should feel like they are, uh, even after some of the exhilarating speeches and whatnot he has to give to pump them up when they're trailing halftime. But. Delaney, yeah. Delaney Fitzgerald is an experience, and uh, if you're ever uh, lucky enough to be okay. on the sideline with him, you you will have a blast, especially if his team pulls out a victory at the end of the day. Also, thanks to the Frostburg fans that came up and introduced themselves. They loved our uh, lineman video uh, a few uh, or a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, definitely I uh, got some notice uh, from their fan base. We appreciate you folks for watching as well. and appreciate Coach Fitzgerald for helping us out with uh, so much. Um, Let's talk more about them in the Wesley situation. Let, let's just go through these conference uh, rundowns uh, real fast. And I actually, uh, for once, did a okay. little uh, advance work to make sure we had the right order because we never uh. seem to do that correctly. Hey, who knew? <laughs> but we're going to start yeah, as we normally do in New England with the CCC. So we'll uh, get to the NJAC, save the best for last here, right, probably. And in the CCC, uh, the standings look like this, 4-0 and and the cop. 3 and 0 Western New England, 2 and 1 Nichols, 2 and 1 Salve Regina. Endicott with a game in hand against the teams. It's really coming down to it looks like Endicott Western New England no matter what happens here in a game in a conference that only 6 games are played in, don't forget. And Endicott's only yeah. two remaining opponents are in week 10 versus Western New England and in week 11 versus Salve Regina. So you know, uh, we'll look at the permutations about what the tiebreakers could look like ultimately for a lot of these conferences over the next week. But Endicott's next game is home versus Western New England in Week 10. In week 9, Western New yeah. England has to get through Nichols first at Nichols. And that's going to be a challenge uh, for them because Nichols has looked like a much better team this season. They cannot underplay yeah. them in the least. Do I still have this hat on? I forgot about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, for Forgot about that. Um, so that's what that conference uh, looks like right now. Stop me if you have any co uh, comments on any of these because uh, I'm going to fly through otherwise if uh, you're no, okay with that. Husson, 4-0 with SUNY Maritime and Gallaudet at uh, one loss. Gallaudet with a game in hand uh, scenario. Uh, it really does look like that Week 10 game is going to tell us what's going on there because Husson has to play Castleton. If Gallaudet loses to Alfred State somehow next week, then we have to reassess what's going on here, uh, basically. But that Week 10 game, Gallaudet at uh, Husson, which looks like a Husson easy win right now on paper, but you still got to play the game. Uh, yeah. It looks like where the action's going to be at, that's a noontime kickoff for that game. Uh, yeah. Object on that at all? 
Nope, I would keep rolling. Let's go to the MASCAC and uh, Western Connecticut 5-0, and Framingham State 4-1. and We talked about it in the uh, Crunch Time segment. It looks like Western yeah. Connecticut and Framingham State are cruising for a big Week 10 showdown. But, look, UMD only has two losses in conference. Framingham State has to stay awake for that game noontime on Saturday against them. Uh, you know, if they want to have any say in this conference, if they were to lose that game, then Western Connecticut would be playing in week 10 just to basically close it out without anybody yeah. getting to say anything. Either way, they're really doing that, but they wouldn't have to really worry about much in week 10 besides the idea, well, we got two games to win one at that point. Uh, if that's yeah. if Framingham State loses, Framingham State wins, then it's a little different. They would still be playing to win, but if they were to lose that game, then... Uh, they would possibly lose the conference if that if that were to happen. And Pool C would not be a bid that they would achieve. I will almost guarantee you with only five bids out there this year. So you're playing for your playoff life if you're a New England conference right now, as far as I'm concerned. Pretty much, yeah. It's it's, it's either Pool A or, or nothing, unless you're MIT. <laughs> yeah, and we're going there next. The new Mac, MIT 4-0. Merchant Marine and Springfield at 4-1. and Uh What's the game next week, you ask? It's a big one. MIT at WPI. 1 o'clock wow. Saturday. That's a huge game. I, and I think if you're a Springfield fan, your allegiance may have turned upside down. You might have been rooting for WPI before Saturday's game against uh, Merchant Marine because you wanted to create a three-way tie yeah. that way. Now you have to root for MIT to beat Merchant Marine because you want to be able to take out MIT yourself to win the tiebreaker if it comes down to it. Although the tiebreakers are meaningless yep. because it's the committee that's going to decide which team is the best team. But I, I would say that if Springfield were 8-2 and two against MIT's 7-1 and one with the conference played by Springfield with an identical conference record, Springfield would definitely have an edge with a head-to-head win at that point. Uh, in that, and only Thomas Moore would be able to sneak ahead, which is possible. So Springfield could help set up the new Mac for no teams getting through, but St. John's has to beat, or excuse me, Thomas Moore has to beat St. John's. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Thomas Moore's schedule is just too difficult. I think that they're going to end up seven and three at best case scenario. So one of these New England teams will get the will get the bid. It just depends on who it's going to be. Well, or for the first time ever, we'll see a team uh, with two more losses than another team actually jump them uh, it's possible that a seven and Maybe. three times more would be viewed ahead of both a, a nine and one mit if they if go ahead if they give st john's if they give st john's a good run for their money considering how highly ranked st john's is then i can see the committee you know sort of giving them the benefit of the doubt and and, and giving them that we'll see We'll see. It, it'll be interesting. Uh, we got a lot more to talk about with the new Mac. We said it a couple weeks ago. It's probably going to be one of the best conference races down to the wire with them and the end jack. Um, I didn't say the new jack this time, although it was right on the tip of my tongue for some reason again. Uh, Amherst 6-0, Trinity 5-1, and Tufts 5-1, and though not a playoff implication here. Let's uh, round out the uh, New England conferences again with this uh, NESCAC mm -hmm. situation. Amherst, they still have to play. Next week, uh, it is Tufts at home. Uh, then they have to travel to Trinity in Week 10. Hey, Trinity, congratulations. Despite that loss to Williams, you seem to have a lot more control in this conference than anybody else, I would say, right now. Hartford State, baby. They're rolling. But Middlebury is going to take on Trinity this week. Can't overlook Middlebury. The Panthers uh, took out uh, Williams. Uh, Williams beat Trinity. The law of syllogism says, yeah, well, we'll see how much that plays out. Let's uh, keep advancing here to the Empire 8. Brockport, Cortland. There you go. There's, there's all you need to know. That's it. Yep. Next. Well, St. John Fisher could uh, do uh, Brockport a world of favor on uh, week nine if they were able to travel to Cortland and win at 2 o'clock. St. John Fisher, though, having a horrible season at 1-3 and three in the conference, 1-5 and five overall. I don't see much hope for them beating yeah. Cortland right now. As uh, Segala and company have been on fire, no pun intended, 4-1 uh, uh, in the conference, 6-1 overall, Brockport 4-0, 7-0. I, I just can't remember a team doing in the East region in our modern, let's say, 32 or 28 teams set up back before that. 
doing what yeah, no. they are doing defensively. I, I even my union in the present day. I, I just I can't remember teams doing this. I we we are used to teams winning by sixty points uh, week in week out. Okay, that was my union, Mary Hart and Baylor of the old days. But I don't remember this level of defensive performance from start to finish. Normally, the numbers start kind of yeah. ginning upward a little bit for the losing team at the end of a game. They are serious about keeping these defensive yards intact at the ends of games. It, it, it's clear to me because it was minus 45 They're... most of the second half, minus 48 in the final in the rushing yards. Well, I mean, you know, the, the NCAA has been very transparent on what it takes to get that number one seed. And if I'm Jason Mangoni, I am going to win, and I'm going to win as big as I possibly can. And with such a loaded roster of uh, seniors and fifth years, you know, all Americans in various different you know, spots on that defense, they, they are really, I mean, I, sometimes I wonder if, if they're even better than Mary Harden Baylor, who's been ranked ahead of them um, for a while. I mean, I know Mary Hard, Harden Baylor's defense is, is pretty solid, but, you know, I mean, we got to see the Brockport offense up front and center, and, and so far the Crusaders' offense to me has been kind of eh. So, I mean, the Stag Bowl could be uh, Mountain Union against Brockport, depending on how the, the brackets come out. I, I'm guessing that probably Mountain Union may end up playing Brockport for, in the Final Four, possibly, but. I mean, Brock looks as good, if not better, than any East Region team that I can remember in the last 25 years. Uh, I, I, it, there are so many different permutations of where they could put teams. Could Frostburg State possibly get its own number one seat somewhere? That's still within the realm of possibilities, although geographically that would create a mess uh, yeah, nationally. St. John's probably deserves it more than they do. Ultimately, it comes down to it also, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Liberty League, RPI, 2-0. They're the only undefeated conference team, uh, your conference undefeated team, if you want to go that way. Ithaca two and one, Hobart two and one. Uh, they have beaten both Ithaca and Hobart at this point. St. Lawrence is the only team they have not beaten with one loss, and so St. Lawrence is going to have their chance in week number ten at noon. Uh I'll, all I'll say is that RPI t to me doesn't look like a top twenty-five team. But they they figure out ways to win ball games. And well, that so defense has done great. Credit. Yeah, yeah, and and honestly, the offense makes just enough plays to to keep themselves out of trouble. They don't shoot themselves into the foot in, in the foot. So, um, I don't see anyone stopping RPI in the Liberty League. I think they're just going to win it out, and they'll probably be hosting some New England or other team in the first round of the playoffs. St. Lawrence first has to get through Ithaca to make that a big game in Week 10. Uh, St. Lawrence uh, at Ithaca is at 1 o'clock. Uh, Union is off, and Hobart is off on the 27th. Yeah. Um, and uh, then Week 10, it's St. Lawrence at RPI, Rochester Union, Ithaca to Hobart, which is an important game just for standings purposes, if nothing else, yeah. to be a team maybe just waiting in the wings if RPI absolutely drops two games somehow. Uh, RPI Rochester coming up on Saturday. Hey, Chad Martinovich, you want a uh, big sin signature win at home? There's your chance. I mean, look, I, Rochester's had that kind of season that you just don't want to think about. But you know what? Single games can redefine seasons. We'll see what happens there. That's true. Mac, 5-0 and DelVal, 5-0 and Misericordia, 5-1 and Stevenson right now. Stevenson's lost to Delaware Valley, but they figure into this whole thing because the tiebreaker, we've learned, the third tiebreaker yeah. essentially says the following. DelVal is going to benefit from their game versus Stevenson because of the strength it gives their schedule at the end of the day versus okay. Misericordia's strength of schedule. That's the easiest way for me to say it. Misericordia didn't play, I believe it was, F, uh, didn't play... Uh, Delval, and obviously Delval didn't play Misericordia, and the uh, who was the other team they didn't play? They don't, they don't play Stevenson either, so they're not going to right. benefit from beating them head to head. So their their remaining games are at Kings, Albright, and Lyco, which I think you know may have a kind. You know, I don't even know if those three teams have above five hundred records. So their strength of schedule is just going to keep going down. I mean, the good thing for the Cougars is that they'll probably win out um, realistically, but when it comes to um, you know Del Val's schedule, uh, I think you know they they're probably also in a similar spot where they've been through 
the toughest part of their conference. The only thing I could see that could trip things up, Frank, is that final week 11 game at Widener just because of that rivalry there and it can kind of throw the records out the window. Yeah, so again, because Misericordia doesn't play Stevenson, and DelVal does, and since Stevenson's going to be above FDU Florham uh, in terms of the conference record at the end of the day, we know that already, yeah. uh, then essentially DelVal wins the tiebreaker. Uh, there's almost no way to avoid that at this point. Uh, if somehow Stevenson and FDU Florham end up tied, then it goes to a fifth tiebreaker, which uh, it goes basically reverse or, or uh, well, top to bottom order, uh, who won by more, basically, against the, st- the team that will be number three in the standings, number four in the standings, if you, we need to go that far, with a maximum differential of 17 points. Again, that's Del Val leading that one right now. So it looks like no matter what, Del Val wins this tiebreaker. And yeah. Misericordia would have to hope for a pool C bid at that point if they were to finish nine and one. I don't know how possible that would be uh, under the circumstances. Not with, not with a loss to Merchant Marine, who who may or may not be the new MAC champ, or may or may not win the pool B bid there. So I think they're they're probably looking at a uh, at hosting one of those smack the bowls, but we'll see. Yeah. So if you are a uh, Misericordia fan, you have to hope that Del Val loses. That's basically it, yeah, or that basically. Stevenson loses three games total in the conference this season. Uh, they have to lose know. both their two remaining games, and Stevenson still plays like Homing and FDU Florham. They will win at least one of those games, that's I will tell you yeah. right now. So yeah. that's the way it goes, uh, Ms. Recordia fans. you got to hope that Del Val trips. That's, that's about it right now. And Jack, mm-hmm. well, you got separation. You, you, you've always talked about separation Saturdays and whatnot. Well, we got separation here. Salisbury 6-0, Frostburg 5-0. Yep. Um, they will have one less conference game because of the Christopher Newport cancellation due to Hurricane Florence yep. uh, back when. So we'll, we'll look at them as play, something in O teams, both of them right now. They each have mm-hmm. two games left. Salisbury, uh, excuse me, uh, they each have three games left. Salisbury at Rowan, Wesley at Salisbury, Salisbury at Frostburg State. That's week 11. <sighs> What so Wesley cop. Salisbury, <laughs> Wesley could essentially, if Salisbury were to lose to Rowan, Wesley would hold yeah. the keys in their hand as to whether that Week 11 game would even matter for Frostburg State or not uh, in terms of even getting into the playoffs. So first things first, Salisbury's yeah. got to play Rowan. Uh, you heard the Lane Fitzgerald complain about he won't beat Southern Virginia the way his team played on uh, this Saturday, this past Saturday. Uh, and uh, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but nonetheless, that's the game coming up here. His former uh, school that he used to coach for, I, if you look carefully, yeah. you would see their helmet on his uh, bookcase when we did our that's interview right. with him. It's up there. Yeah, that's <laughs> So, uh, you know, he, he remembers his roots for sure. But Salisbury at Rowan is the big game coming up this next weekend because now it's them with zero losses, Wesley Montclair and Rowan and Christopher Newport with two losses underneath them. There is separation there, and the likelihood it's either likelihood is it's either Salisbury or Frostburg State that will win the NJAC now. And the loser, if they were to win out, will likely get a pool C bid. We thought it was gonna be Wesley yeah. for a while that was in that pool C uh catbird not. seat. Not anymore, folks. It looks like the loser yeah, of that, that game as long it. as they finish nine and one. That would break probably one of the longer playoff streaks in recent years. I mean, I think the, the Wolverines have been to the NCAA tournament now, what, like 13, 14, 15 seasons in a row. That would be a huge change um, if they if they didn't qualify for the tournament, which they're in jeopardy of not making now with that second loss. JB, your uh, video's going to in and out a little bit. That's usually the good sign that we're going to uh, need to cut this thing off. But uh, before we uh, do go, uh, I mean, we looked at the NJAC. We've looked at the new Mac. Those seem to be the two races really to watch right now. But that Empire 8 game, Brockport Cortland in Week 10, we got to try to bump up that game by about an hour. But let's write Eric Hart this week. Eric, if you're watching this, Jason Mangoni, Cortland folk, uh, yes, Fran Elia and company, <laughs> Please move that game to 1 o'clock so that we can put it in the Blitzer show comfortably instead of having to wait uh, an extra hour for it. Because we'd love to feature that as part of not that one of the big apart. games. No, seriously. One, yeah. o- 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock isn't that far apart either when you think about it. Uh, especially, you yeah. want to end those games earlier. It's, it's 
you know, the, the time's changing and all this other stuff's going on. It gets dark early, you know. Come on, guys. You can do this for us. Anyway, um, those <laughs> seem to be the races to watch. Uh, what, what, are, what else are you watching for right now if you had to pick anything? Yeah, I think I think that covers it. I mean, there's you know, it'll be interesting to sort of see how these uh, certain tiebreakers may or may not come into play in the next couple of weeks. We've got you know, three more weeks of game, so should be should be an exciting finish. Can't wait. Same here. We got some interviews coming up throughout the week, as you know. If uh, this is the first one out, and uh, we enjoyed uh, that uh, interview set from last week very much. Appreciated the schools for sending them out. Wahid Nabi and Jason Mangoni. Mangoni got twenty five hundred views. We appreciate the Rockport support as wow. always. Thank you, folks, for that, and uh, thank you for watching this as well. If you stuck around the whole time, we love we love you for it. <laughs> yeah. Be well, folks. We'll see you later in the week.